Hello, this presentation illustrates the ideas contained within my capstone, a cross-theoretical model of persuasion. I made it for marketers, pitchers, and communicators who want to convey a message in the most effective way but need help deciding the method. When should you try to convince your audience with rational arguments? When should you use a story? And when will a sexy ad will work just fine? I took the major persuasion theories from decades of psychological research and condensed them into a single cross-theoretical model containing a decision tree to help non-experts choose the best route to persuasion based on their audience motivation to elaborate. We'll run through all these theories using simple examples, cartoons, and diagrams to end with a decision tree that summarizes my model. I set my model in between stages of the trans-theoretical model which considers behavioral change a multi-step process that goes from a pre-contemplation stage all the way to maintenance. Instead of explaining behavioral change across all stages, my model focuses on change occurring between two stages, say, contemplation and planning, or pre-contemplation and contemplation. It doesn't matter. What matters is that each new message could take a different approach regardless of the one taken a step before. We begin by defining persuasion. According to O'Keefe, persuasion is an intentional effort at influencing another's mental state through communication in a circumstance in which the persuadee or recipient has some measure of freedom. The intentional effort through communication from this definition implies the existence of a message which could be overly persuasive, such as most lessons in science books, news reports, and speeches, or take the form of narratives from which we learn vicariously. The term measure of freedom differentiates persuasion from coercion, which involves a direct and unavoidable threat, and mental state can be equated to behavioral intention. Thus, successful persuasion efforts involve the recipient's intent to change his behavior in response to a message. Attitude is a person's general evaluation of an object, and thus a major directive of behavioral intention. As these overly persuasive messages suggest, behavioral intention can be altered through communication. The summative model of attitude expresses attitude in measurable terms by making it a function of one's strength of salient beliefs towards an object and the valuation one has of such beliefs. In this example, based on the beliefs I chose as salient, Lola's attitude toward Coca-Cola is negative. She thinks that Coca-Cola is American and that it is delicious, and that is good, but she also thinks that it can make her gain weight, and that is bad. We could say that she has a negative attitude toward Coca-Cola, but these are only cognitive beliefs. If we consider affective beliefs, Lola's attitude towards Coca-Cola is quite positive. Lola associates Coca-Cola with memories of her childhood and her family, of days at the beach and parties. Every decision we make depends on how our brains process information, that which we perceive through the senses, like a cupcake, and that from past experiences and knowledge residing within our memory, that makes us associate that cupcake with celebration. We do not treat all information equally, however, but give more weight to that which triggers an emotional response. Emotions are indicators of progress towards a goal, and thus, they serve as directives to modify cognition and behavior so as to make that goal attainable. This little boy's goal is to make it to the castle on the right end of the screen. But then a demon appears. Anger signals that a goal has failed, but that it can be reinstated if we put up a fight. Joy signals that our goal has been attained or is nearly accomplished. Sadness indicates that a goal is irrevocably lost. We also make decisions based on heuristics, mental shortcuts derived from previous experiences and guided by emotions to draw inferences and discern between possible actions. Consider this experiment. The researchers asked the participants to sample wine and rate it, yet they let the participants know the wine's price and country of origin. When the participants thought that the price was low, they tended to rank Italian wine as high as French wine, yet much higher than Mexican wine. When they were told that the price was high, 
the participants ranked all wines higher, regardless of the country of origin. Of course, the researchers served all participants exactly the same wine. Flavor had nothing to do with their decision. Together with emotions, heuristics serve as behavioral guides. Emotions lead the way, and heuristics assist us in making rapid evaluations and choices. While not always correct, these rapid decisions require little processing power, saving us precious time. The theory of recent action expands a summative model of attitude. To consider behavioral intention a function of attitude as well as subjective norms composed by inductive norms, the opinions of those close to us, such as family, and descriptive norms, the opinions of the general public. Additionally, the model considers one's perceived behavioral control, which comes from Bandura's concept of self-efficacy, from social cognitive theory, our perceived ability to produce an effect via our actions. In the form of an equation, the theory of recent action could be summarized as behavioral intention equals attitude towards a behavior plus inductive norms plus descriptive norms plus perceived behavioral control, where W1234 represents the weight that each component has on intention. Now, the weight of the perceived behavioral control, W4, depends on a positive value of the sum of all the other components, because the ability to perform an action, like jumping off a bridge, and confidence in the desired effect, droning, are necessary conditions, yet not sufficient to guarantee intention. Just because you are capable of jumping from a bridge and die doesn't mean that you will. To illustrate how affecting each component on the equation can affect intention, let us follow Lola and her four-year-old son, Terry, into a store where the little boy discovers a lollipop. Worried about his weight, Lola refuses to buy the candy. In response, Terry drops to the floor with a tantrum. To stop this behavior, Lola could attempt to change Terry's attitude by using rational arguments to affect his appreciation for candy, say, by lecturing him on the consequences of consuming too much sugar. She could also invoke an injunctive norm by reminding him that his father wouldn't approve of the behavior, or a descriptive norm by pointing at the people around them and reminding the boy of the importance of guaranteeing everyone's enjoyment. She could also simply ignore the tantrum and let Terry scream until he gets tired, in hopes that this will make him reevaluate the efficacy of his tantrums. Let us assume for now that Lola finds this last option unappealing because it could lead to further embarrassment. The other three propositions involve an overly persuasive message that appeals to the child's rationality. As anyone who has ever dealt with small children knows, trying to convince one to avoid candy because of the potential detriments of consuming too much sugar or appealing to the opinions of others is not the fastest route to success. A child lacks the judgment to cooperate, and argumentation is a cooperative venture that requires the recipient's willingness to be convinced through the justification of claims. This unwillingness to accept counter-attitudinal arguments results from what Petty and Cachopo called biased processing, where individuals assimilate new information under the terms of already established biased knowledge, making them unable to appreciate the merits of strong arguments. Think of the opinion Republicans have of Democrats, and the one Democrats have of Republicans. Because of their existing biases, opposite parties often cannot reach an agreement. Social judgment theory considers bias processing and the role that emotions play in decision making. This theory proposes that persuasion depends on how a recipient compares the position advocated in a message to his judgmental latitudes on the topic. Terry's latitude of acceptance, the range of propositions he deems reasonable, includes cakes, donuts, and candy. His latitude of non-commitment, the range of propositions with which he neither agrees nor disagrees, contains fruit. His latitude of rejection runs from broccoli and onion, passing by all kinds of vegetables to perhaps tomatoes, the least questionable but still objectionable proposition. Only those messages containing propositions compatible with terrorist positions within his latitudes of acceptance or non-commitment will lead to attitude change. That is, Terry will only accept propositions that include sweets or fruit. Should the message fall within his latitude of rejection, 
attitude change will not occur unless Lola changes the contents of her message or the manner in which she presents it. When a recipient assesses the position advocated in a message as compatible with the positions in his latitude of acceptance, change will occur as a consequence of trying to reduce the dissonance resulting from the discrepancy between his current intention and that advocated by the message by doing a self-assessment of his ability to change. Thus, when confronted with an invitation to exercise more, a man who already believes in the benefits of exercise will change his intention. If his perceived behavioral control or self-efficacy is high, say, if he has the time and he can afford the gym membership. However, if his perceived behavioral control is low, perhaps because he thinks he cannot afford a gym membership, persuasion will depend on the likelihood that a new proposition could increase his perceived behavioral control. When nothing will do, maybe because the closest gym is in another town, persuasion won't occur. If perceived behavioral control can be increased, however, persuasion will depend on how this new proposition affects his self-efficacy, as in that other gym is much closer. When a proposition falls within a recipient's latitude of non-commitment, persuasion will depend on his likelihood of, to elaborate on the merits of the proposition. This is a central tenet of the elaboration likelihood model. Before we proceed with explaining this model, let us go back and consider the case in which a proposition falls within a recipient's latitude of rejection. In this case, persuasion is simply not possible. To affect behavior, a persuader must create a new proposition. Functional approaches to attitude suggest that in order to change intention, a persuader needs to assess a recipient's attitude function first, then adapt the message so that it no longer attempts to change an attitude that is seemingly immutable, but to change the function this attitude serves. When using a functional approach, one must distinguish first between the properties of an object and the function of the recipient's attitude towards that object. In our example, Terry sees tantrums as a way to call people's attention, which he then values positively because it works on affecting his mother's intention. The function of his attitude is, therefore, to lead his mother into giving him what he craves, candy. Cats consider four types of attitude functions. Utilitarian, which seeks to maximize rewards and minimize risks, as happens with someone that has a positive attitude toward a specific supermarket simply because it is close to his house. Ego defense, which protects us from a perceived attack on self-esteem, as would be the case of someone labeling as hate what in reality is constructive criticism. Value expression, which expresses central values and self-image, as when a woman chooses not to identify herself as a feminist, despite her inherent desire for equality, because she associates feminism with authoritarianism. And knowledge, which simply helps to better understand the world by reducing it into small categories. Men wear pants, women wear skirts, therefore a woman that wears pants is less of a woman. In our example, Terry's attitude towards tantrums has a utilitarian function. Thus, a proposition that affects Terry's beliefs about tantrums or his efficacy to obtain what he wants with a tantrum may change his intention. Another approach to interpreting the function of an attitude is to use personality traits as a proxy. High self-monitors worry about the image they present to others. Low self-monitors are not as concerned about what others think. Thus, for high self-monitors, subjective norms have a heavier weight on their intentions, while for low self-monitors, their personal attitude, more than the opinion of others, molds their behavior. Like most children his age, Terry is a low self-monitor and his attitude has a utilitarian function. The best way to render his present attitude as no longer effective would be to change his immediate goals with either the promise of a reward or the threat of a punishment. The problem with this approach is that Lola may find herself having to please or displease her son constantly because a reward or punishment will change the focus of the child's attention temporarily, but in the long run, it will reinforce the existing attitude. 
and the mother wants to make good behavior the norm, not a conditioned exception. According to Ryan and Deci's self-determination theory, there are two types of motivation, based on the reasons that lead to action. Intrinsic motivation, as when we do something because it is inherently interesting or enjoyable, and extrinsic motivation, when we do something because it leads to a separate outcome, such as a reward or the avoidance of a sanction. Lola could increase Terry's extrinsic motivation by replacing externally imposed regulations, such as the threat of a punishment, with regulations with which Terry can identify because they lead to a valued reward, such as a toy. Or better, by replacing external regulations with the integrated regulations, which Terry would assimilate into his concept of self, as would be the case if he learned to behave properly, not only because he expects a reward, but also because he takes pride in being well-poised and has made good behavior part of his identity. Self-determination theory makes motivation a function of satisfying the psychological needs of autonomy, capability, and relatedness. The more these psychological needs are satisfied, the greater our motivation to perform a task. Autonomy refers to being free from external influence, when instead of doing as told, we have a complete control over our behavior, we perform much better. Capability refers to having confidence on our ability to perform a task. When we receive positive feedback on our performance, either from others or through verification of having obtained the desired results, our motivation grows. Relatedness refers to satisfying our need to belong by developing an effective connection to others. When we feel that we are part of something greater, our motivation grows. Video games are so addictive because they constantly motivate us. They give players the autonomy to explore a new world and interact with the objects within that world. They give constant feedback on what constitutes good behavior with catchy sounds and extra points and start easy but become increasingly challenging to keep us interested, satisfying our need of feeling competent. And they make us feel part of a community that appreciates our efforts. Thus, in order to increase the chances of persuasion, Lola's new proposition should take into account the function of Terry's attitude and his personality and should satisfy as much as possible his needs of autonomy, capability, and relatedness. With this proposition, Lola can craft a new message. Now, will an overly persuasive message suffice, or should she deliver the message in the form of a narrative? And if an overly persuasive message is enough, should she use a more analytical or a more effective approach to increase persuasion? The elaboration likelihood model predicts that when the motivation to elaborate is high, that is, the motivation to engage in a diligent consideration of issue-relevant arguments, persuasion depends on the quality of the arguments. When the motivation to elaborate is low, persuasion can still result from a peripheral route, that is, through low-effort processes such as association with either positive or negative cues or inferential processes such as heuristics and other cognitive shortcuts. Most advertising attempts to persuade us through a peripheral route. Examples of associative processes include conditioning, in which we associate an object, in this case breakfast cereal, with a stimuli that has a positive meaning, the Star Wars movies, and repeated exposure, such as a billboard of a TV show which makes attitude towards an object more favorable. The three most common heuristics used in decision-making are liking, which refers to our tendency to agree with messages or speakers we like, authority, our tendency to trust the opinion of those we consider experts, and consensus, our tendency to make inferences based on others' decisions. Thus, if the argument quality is high and the likelihood to elaborate is also high, crafting an overly persuasive message with a more analytical approach that is, making use of inductive or deductive reasoning and relying on probable evidence 
can be sufficient to achieve persuasion. This is a central route to persuasion from the elaboration likelihood model. Now, if the likelihood to elaborate is low, a more effective approach, one that will lead to persuasion through a peripheral route, should be preferred. The same applies when the quality of the arguments is low, in which case elaboration would be counterproductive. When the argument quality is low, or the likelihood to elaborate is low because the subject is too difficult, too boring, or too irrelevant, an overly persuasive message crafted with a more effective approach will suffice if the likelihood of biased processing is low because the new proposition falls within the recipient's latitudes of acceptance or non-commitment, and the desired effect of persuasion is also low because sustained behavioral change is unnecessary, as it would be the case with a one-time change, such as a small purchase. I say a more analytical or a more effective approach, because the methods are not exclusive. A message can use both rational arguments and inferential cues to persuade. In this Coca-Cola ad, an attractive model, bright colors, and a setting that suggests that a family is about to have a meal are weak arguments that by appealing to the viewer's emotions imply that drinking Coca-Cola can bring joy. Stating the size of the bottle, on the other hand, is a strong argument that appeals to the viewer's rationality and can be verified. This other ad from the Los Angeles DWP uses mostly an analytical approach, yet the shades of blue and evocative images attract the viewer's attention with low effort processes. Now, if the likelihood of biased processing is still high because a new proposition would fall within the recipient's latitude of rejection, an overly persuasive message may not do, and narrative persuasion will be necessary. The same if the desired effect of persuasion is high because the effects of narrative persuasion last longer. Narrative persuasion results from the affective as well as cognitive consideration of behavior, beliefs, situational cues, and attitudes portrayed within a story under a state of narrative transportation. The transportation imagery model proposes that narrative persuasion can be more effective than rhetorical persuasion in causing a change of beliefs and affecting behavior because, during a state of narrative transportation, engagement with the contents of a message increases while counter-arguing diminishes. Uncle Tom's Cabin is a classic example of how a successful narrative can influence public opinion. By showing the horrors of slavery, the novel gave strength to the abolitionist movement that led to the Civil War in the U.S. Narrative transportation is a mental process in which, as a result of devoting his full attention to the events depicted in a story and developing empathy for the characters, a recipient that is, a reader, viewer, or listener, depending on the medium, feels transported into the story world, to the point that the physical world stops feeling accessible. Instead of seeing activity in their physical surroundings, transported readers see the action of the story unfolding before them. During a state of narrative transportation, busy in recreating the mental imagery evoked by a story, and focused on how the events in the narrative unfold, we are left with fewer cognitive resources to invest in anything else, including generating thoughts to discount information contrary to our own experience. This suspension of disbelief results in reduced counter-arguing that makes successfully transported individuals more receptive to persuasive content embedded within story, to the point that they may change their attitudes to match the ones proposed by the narrative. Now, if narrative persuasion is more effective than overly persuasive messages, why shouldn't we transform every proposition into a story? First, because overly persuasive messages are economical. Then, because not every proposition can be easily transformed into a story. Additionally, Narrative persuasion depends on successfully inducing a state of transportation, which depends on several factors. The message must take the form of a narrative, the recipient's attributes, the story attributes, and the medium. The extended transportation imagery model 
differentiates between a story as one that is told by a storyteller and a narrative as one that results from the recipient's interpretation of the story with a subsequent attribution of meaning. The distinction is important first because it allows for an economy that does not have to come at the expense of increasing ambiguity or reducing engagement. A story only needs to evoke imagery and suggest the occurrence of certain events for the recipient to create the imagery in his mind and fill in the gaps in the story. Then, because a volitional and effortful interpretation of a story as opposed to mere exposure forces recipients to generate thoughts related to the narrative, giving persuaders the opportunity to include persuasive content within a story. The recipient's attributes refer to their ability to experience absorption, interpret the story, and create mental imagery. These are affected by demographics, such as age and education. Transportability, a recipient's inherent propensity to get lost into a story. Attention, and the familiarity that the recipient has with the genre or situational cues portrayed in the story. If you can recognize the sword in the stone as that of King Arthur, you can more easily be transported by a story about this myth. The storyteller attributes refer not only to aesthetics and the artistry of the storyteller to suggest imagery, but to the inclusion of identifiable characters that give the recipient a clear indication of who the story is about and what their goals and present attitude are. The development of an imaginable plot that sparks the creation of mental imagery and the speculative thoughts by introducing conflict and verisimilitude, the apparent truthiness of the story. While fiction often breaks the rules of what is possible, the more cogent and lifelike the events portrayed in a story feel, the more transported a recipient will be. The medium can increase transportation by easing and speeding the creation of mental imagery and thus intensifying the illusion of presence within the story world. While print narratives allow for self-pacing, they are not as immersive as motion pictures or 360 video because these provide much more detailed information than a print narrative can in the same amount of time, and thus they introduce the viewer to unfamiliar objects or situations much more efficiently and without disrupting the pace of the narrative by calling the attention of the recipient to the medium in the way of a lengthy description would. A solution then for Lola's dilemma considering Terry's assessment of her position as contrary to his, Terry's attitude function utilitarian, Terry's personality low self-monitor, his low motivation to elaborate, and Lola's desire to change his behavior not just once but permanently would be an engaging narrative one in which the child is shown via symbolic modeling of the possible consequences of engaging in rowdy behavior. Good children receive Christmas presents. Bad children get the Krampus. Lola's example can be extrapolated for situations in which biases prevent elaboration, and thus an overly persuasive message will not do. Consider this video. The police officer justifies his aggression by saying that black people are violent. His behavior is obviously racist, but simply calling him a racist won't change his attitude. 
what can be done to change his attitude? From the explanation that he gives, we learn the function of his attitude, knowledge. He behaves that way because he wrongly believes that African Americans are inherently violent and more so than other groups. He also believes that it is his duty to protect innocent people from crime. Because his bias is part of his concept of self as a protector of the innocent, the police officer will probably not accept any proposition contrary to his beliefs. His bias may be reinforced because, as a police officer, he normally deals with violent incidents, some of which involve African American people. He probably sees white people committing crimes too, but because he is white and his close network is probably white too, he sees white people under non-violent circumstances much more often than he sees black people behaving non-violently. Hence, he does not develop a bias towards whites as criminals from direct experience the same way he does for black people. The portrayal of African Americans as predators in media can only reinforce his biased attitude. To change the police officer's attitude and therefore stop his racist behavior, the knowledge function of his attitude needs to be rendered ineffective by introducing ambiguity. The police officer needs to learn that his beliefs are wrong, so, as the theory of recent action predicts, the expected consequences of his behavior will change. Because just like Terry, he may not be open to elaborate, the new beliefs should be acquired through symbolic modeling under conditions of narrative transportation to reduce the possibility of counter-arguing, that is, through engaging stories that could help him relate to others different from him. The stories should include identifiable characters who lead a non-violent life and have clear goals with which someone with a racist attitude could still relate, effectively simulating the experience of belonging to the same group. After developing an emotional connection with the character's goals, conflict should arise in the form of an antagonist with a racist attitude thwarting the main character. The antagonist should eventually learn of the pain he causes and decide to change his behavior. From modeling that shows that otherness does not imply a threat and that a racist attitude causes unnecessary pain, he can learn to treat people with respect and compassion better than he could from an overly persuasive message. Our complete model then looks like this. The recipient assesses a persuader's position. Does it fall within his latitude of acceptance, his latitude of non-commitment, or his latitude of rejection? If it falls within his latitude of rejection, the persuader should draft a new proposition, one that considers the function of the recipient's attitude and his personality trait, and motivates the recipient to perform the proposed behavior by satisfying as much as possible the needs of autonomy, capability, and relatedness. If the argument quality of this new proposition is high, and the likelihood to elaborate is also high, crafting an overly persuasive message with an analytical approach can be sufficient to achieve persuasion. If the likelihood to elaborate is low, or the argument quality is low, and the likelihood of biased processing is also low, and so is the need of sustained change, an overly persuasive message with a more effective approach will suffice. However, if the likelihood of biased processing is high, narrative persuasion should be the preferred path. The same if the desired effect of persuasion is also high. The recipient will then assess the proposition contained within the overly persuasive message or within the narrative. If this new proposition falls within his latitude of non-commitment, persuasion will depend on the recipient's likelihood to elaborate. If the new proposition falls within the recipient's latitude of acceptance, but his perceived behavioral control or self-efficacy is low, when the likelihood of changing his perceived behavioral control is high, persuasion will depend on drafting a new proposition. When the likelihood of changing a recipient's perceived behavioral control is low, 
persuasion may not be possible. Now, if the recipient's perceived behavioral control is high, then persuasion is possible. That's it. Thank you for watching. If you are interested in reading the whole paper or checking the whole list of references, please visit my blog by clicking on this link. Thank you and goodbye.